Well, thanks guys for showing up. Appreciate this. Uh, I know many of you are reworking your schedules so that you can make our time uh, here at 2 o'clock. Others of you, this is class time anyway. Uh, so congratulations for showing up for regular class time. Um, for the rest of you, uh, thank you uh, for, again, reworking your schedule. Uh, as Dr. Dr. Braylock said, I uh, look forward to a good conversation. Uh, good, a good time of uh, asking questions of each other, uh, being willing to share and listen to each other, uh, and hopefully we can make some progress as, uh, as we move along. So on April 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered an address to Bishop Charles J. Mason Temple in Memphis. And uh, I want us to think a little bit about the final remarks he made in that address. In those, uh, in those final moments during that address, he, he begins to think and say some things about death, and about his own death in particular. Not knowing, of course, that the very next day he would be assassinated. So I think it's worth reflecting together on these comments that King makes in this, his last address. King says this, Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then, I think about my own death. And I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. Every now and then, I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave that word to you this morning. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and to serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I wanted to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the Master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Philosophy, of course, raises these questions of life and death. It confronts us with how we're going to live our lives, how we will navigate this world. And it may even occur to you to, as Martin Luther King Jr. did, wonder what would you want said at your funeral? What would you want people to say about you? What remarks would you have them offer as they reflect on your own existence? You heard King's convictions. And of course, King, throughout his life, and even in death, provoked us to think even more about what our stories will be like. Show Baraka's music and his life also provokes those same questions, gets us to think about matters of life and death, and so that's why I'm delighted uh, that Show is with us here today, educated at Tuskegee University and the University of North Texas. Show studied television and film, anthropology and public administration. He's become an artist, a philosopher, and social thought leader in contemporary culture. He spent nine years traveling the world as a recording artist and as a public speaker. 
He's done numerous overseas activist work ranging from race relations in South Africa to establishing musical cohorts in Indonesia. He's a founding member of nationally known Christian hip hop group 116 Click. Shobrock is also the founder of the Fourth District. He now desires to blend his artistic platform with his academic meanings to contribute a unique perspective in both arenas in the hopes of raising the standard, thereby raising the culture. Sho currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and he co-leads a consulting network that is active in cultural renewal. Folks, please join me in welcoming Sho Baraka. Institutions like Tuskegee did a wonderful job of 
teaching me a holistic perspective of the New York Times. George Washington Carver's The Book of T. Washington. Frederick Douglass is folks that you may hear once in a black history parade or, or, or I guess you could say lecture, but you get to actually dive deep. And that really taught me a lot and gave me pride in the lineage and heritage that I came from. And it made me realize that everything about my history and my culture, it doesn't just come from slavery, it's just not slavery. And there's a line in one of my songs where I say, uh, um, uh, I say, why does black history always start with slavery? Why does my history always start with slavery? So even when I'm learning, they still put those chains on me. And that creates a, a very subtle psychological nuance. I know it doesn't seem like it's, it's big, but if every time I talk about you and your heritage and your people, I mention slavery and I mention oppression and pain, then you begin to think that about yourself. Not only that, you begin to form your identity of, as, as, as an opposition to your oppressors. Right? So then what happens is I create the zero zone mentality. That's why I can live in a community where if I speak a particular type of dialect, they say you're talking about because, well, if white people do it, then we shouldn't do this. Right? And that's the tension of oppression in, in history, our bad narrative. So this is the reason why my last album is called The Narrative. Is I am trying my best to create a new normal, uh, especially for people who understand uh, the faith and want to process it in a way, as the MLK said, for the benefit of other people, not just for myself. Right? And so I get to high school. I want to be this amazing athlete like my father and my brother. Um, I'm not that good, <laughs> and uh, I have to figure out other things to do, right? Um, I'm not a great gangbanger, because I'm afraid of bullets, and so I don't gangbang, right? And all my other friends would gangbang it. Uh, then I'm like, well, maybe I started to write poetry. Um, my parents taught me about the Harlem Renaissance. I love the Harlem Renaissance. I would study uh, <laughs> still poems from like Langston Hughes, Claude McKay and write on the women or girls, better yet. And they thought I was a genius, and I was like, yeah, girl, that's you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I learned to appreciate art, culture, and music from the Harlem Renaissance. And the one thing I realized is that the girls didn't really like the poets, they liked the rappers. And so I was like, okay, now I need to make that transition. Let me start rapping. And so I started to rap like in high school, and I thought I was pretty good. I started to develop, I got with some friends, we started to. Uh, we formed a group, and we actually got to meet with some, some pretty important executives within the city. We got to travel and show. But uh, upon my graduation, my father, who came back into our life, my life later, told me, he's like, hey, you have to make a decision. Do you want to chase this, this music career as a 17, 18-year-old kid? Or you got to go to college. But you're not living with me. <laughs> so I decided, you know what? Uh, I'm going to go to college. So I went to school. My first year there, I like to joke that I said I made it to party and I almost failed in school. And then I had to make some decisions. But around that same time, my, my older brother and my father both became Christian. And so they would talk to me a lot about Jesus and it was just annoying. And I was like, I really want to hear about this. I just really want to have fun and smoke all the weed in the world. And, but eventually the Lord captured my heart my sophomore year. And then, <laughs> The things that I loved, which was music, the culture, the people, and justice, identity, began to not necessarily conflict with my faith, but I had to realize I could only serve one master. Right? And I was like, well, the Lord doesn't tell me to hate the pop. He doesn't tell me to hate my history and my, my culture. He doesn't tell me to hate music and, and justice, but he wants me to see these things in the proper framework. And so from that point on, I started to realize it's like, all right, how can I use music? How can I use my, my heart for activism? How can I use my heart for culture and people for the glory of not only God, but for the benefit of other people? To so, MLK's okay, point, I want to make sure that when I die, people don't say, well, he was a self selfish jerk. You know what I mean? I want to know how this man laid his life down because he wanted to serve people. He wanted to use his heart for the benefit of people. He wanted to use his life for the benefit of people. And so from that moment was somewhat of a, a catalyst for me to be a, a better artist, to be a better activist, to be a better son, brother, et cetera, et cetera. And so eventually, 
Um, I started to do little shows around the campus because um, I wasn't the most popular guy, but people knew me in this small campus, I guess around the same size as this, about three or four thousand students. And you know, you kind of know people, especially if they're loud and obnoxious, you know that's a loud guy. You know. <laughs> so I was one of the loud guys. Um, and when I became a Christian and I started to kind of change my character and I began to kind of communicate a different message, folks was like, isn't that the, but now it's kind of, it's a weird. And so uh, I brought myself in a different position, being able to kind of change the narrative. And I ended up going to school, uh, finishing school in, uh, in Texas, in the uh, University of North Texas, which is a hit. There I uh, met this tall and guy, I don't know if you guys know, uh, an individual named McCray. Uh, he's an artist as well, and another guy named Tadashi. So we became roommates, and we were all just guys who wanted to rap and wanted to figure out what does it mean to love Jesus and my man back here said, oh my gosh, you're going to cry. So, <clears throat> and we were just guys trying to figure it out. And so, um, we started um, a, uh, a group called Roll 16, which is for Romans 116 to Romans 19, the of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then that kind of like rambunctious group of guys ended up becoming a record label. And we decided, like, well, let's do some music. It took a while for me to really decide to make music, but once I did, I knew, I was like, all right, the things that I want to talk about are probably not going to be accepted in a, in a lot of circles. Yeah. Um, come on, listen. <laughs> <With me. laughs> um, and so, what does it look like to be an artist who is going to operate in a CCM market space or Christian music space? But I want to talk about justice issues. I want to talk about race issues. I want to talk about, uh, I talk about uh, marriage, you know, and hip hop. People don't talk about being happy in there. Like, when's the last song you heard talking about, yo, I love my wife? Pick one if you can't find it. Um, um, and then the other thing is, I wanted to write songs about my children, especially as I um, got towards my second album. Second or third. Um, <coughs> I, have, uh, I have three kids. I have a daughter who's 13, I have, I have a son who's 11, and uh, another son who's five. But my, my boys are on the autism spectrum. And one of the things that I realized is, especially in the community that I grew up in, people didn't talk about disability. They don't talk about health, mental health issues. And usually when you know, there are symptoms of mental, uh, uh, mental health uh, issues or disorders, people say, oh, don't worry, he'll get it. And you're like, no, that's, he's doing right there. That's not, that's not normal. <laughs> And so I said, you know what, instead of confining this and keeping this a secret and, and trying to sell myself as this perfect guy who has a perfect family, though I still believe I have a perfect family, um, the reality is how about I expose my life because I know there are other families out there who are wrestling with what does it mean to be a great father, a great husband, love my child, even though I don't really understand this disability, right? And I felt like hip hop would be a great platform to talk about that. So I wrote a song, with another friend of mine, Propaganda, and it was called I Ain't Gotta Answer. And I, I just don't, I remember writing this song, I don't remember being it, like too emotional, but I listened to it again, like at maybe like a couple months after I wrote it and recorded it, and I just remember just tears coming out of my eyes and thinking like, wow, like this is crazy. And he, maybe even to this day, that's one of the songs that I get the most like responses from, like parents who don't even like hip hop, people who don't even listen to hip hop, but they're like, a friend sent me this song, I just want to thank you for writing this because this has changed my life. Um, my husband is now more of a, like open. He's more uh, transparent. He's more present because of this song. And you've shared some things that I've been like, just struggling with. And so I wanted to just write songs that I felt like dealt with the everyday individual. And especially as an individual who's getting older and older, I can't make songs for 18-year-olds getting you turned up in the club. Like, I'm not there for you. Like, I'm, I'm a grown man. You know what I'm saying? If I keep making music for teenagers, then to me, that's just an extended adolescence. And that's hip-hop's problem, I think, in a lot of ways. There's great music out there, and there are great artists, but I think oftentimes there's this pressure to feel like you have to be relevant to teenagers. And therefore, you got guys who are in their late 30s, early 40s, who are still making songs for the club. And I think that creates a very, a, 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 an imbalance that I think is unhealthy in our culture. Um, and it's not just hip-hop, I think it's a lot of music, musical genres, and film too, entertainment in general. Um, <clears throat> so, 
That's who I am today. Uh, I, I get invited to, to do a lot of speaking engagements because of the type of music I play. Um, it's so interesting that you open up and know, hey, uh, this year, obviously, is the 50 year anniversary of his death, as he talked about on April 4th, he was assassinated. Um, the one thing that a lot of people don't know about MLK's assassination was he was in Memphis because of a sanitation worker strike. And that strike started in February and it ended maybe two or three weeks after he was assassinated. Um, and so the city of, not the city of Memphis, but there's, a, there's an organization in Memphis that wants to kind of like commemorate not only MLK's death, but the actual strike and the people who are part of the strike. And so we're gonna be doing a play, like a musical, very similar to like Hamilton. And they reached out to me to actually participate and to write and uh, to uh, curate, I guess you could say, the play. And these are the kind of things that, like, I'm like, man, that's crazy. Who would ever thought this, you know, this kid was born in Canada, Calgary, Alberta, to be able to have the opportunity to do this. Um, but I just feel like it's, it's <clears throat> I, I feel like, and, and this is one of my favorite philosophies, and I guess I'm bring it back to you, philosophy. G.K. Chesterton. Um, come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, he, he, in his book, um, Evil and uh, Eugenics and Other Evils, he's talk, he talks about how oftentimes the world is so consumed with this question of what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with the world. And he, and he, he, he says, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, let's reposition it. And before we can start asking what's wrong with the world, we have to ask what is good. You know? And the other thing is he determines in, at the end of the first chapter, he says, the reality is what's wrong with the world is really me. Because right? oftentimes what we want to do is deflect the problem on other people as if we're the, what's right with the world and everybody else is what's wrong. And so in my music, I'm not only just asking what's wrong with the world, I'm trying to point people to what is right. And I recognize that people won't always agree on those things with me. Uh, I try to be I guess you say compassionate as well as humble as I posture myself in these types of discussions in the public space. And I think that's part of what's wrong with our society today is we create such polarization in our society and our politics where we don't create any space for humility for people to have civil discourse because this is where I stand and therefore I have this ideological approach that says that I'm very cynical. Another great philosopher that I love is uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Gordon Eber, who talks about we are never more susceptible to evil than when we are convinced we are absolutely right. And if you in this room believe you are absolutely right or in certain days where there's a lot of gray area, then I would say just hold that thing with great compassion and humility. Um, and that gives you room to have very civil discourse. So that's my introduction. I, don't, I live in Atlanta. Yeah, I like bow ties. Yeah, as you can see, this is a rubber. I tied this myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any questions? Thoughts? Comments? Anybody just want to rap about something? Just a verse. You got a verse you just want to say? No. You feel like it? I felt a question. I felt it. No. No. <laughs> yes. Good question. Thank you. Because you obviously either looked at the album cover or you listened to it. Um, so, as an artist, uh, I, I think not just, I don't want people just to just, I don't want to just create a, an album. I think about the whole package. I think about the music. I think about the album cover. So, if you notice the album cover, I have a kind of like a, it's an homage to your more 1800s portrait. So, if you look at, you know, your Frederick Douglass is Abraham Lincoln's. That's that's kind of like the, the way they look. So I'm trying to kind of communicate this kind of like this nostalgia. And so time is very important to me um, in this album, a reflection of, so it gives context, it helps give context. So like when you, for instance, um, and some dates are very specific. Some dates um, have more personal meanings. So for instance, like fathers, some fathers, 2004, that's when my daughter was born. So that's when I became a father. Um, 1865, Baby Vote 1865 is a song, a 
about political uh, dissidents. Right? And so 1865 was the end of the Civil War. Right? So we're talking about this, these strong polarizing sides and this confrontation. And so when you think about 1865, you know, students of history will know oh, this probably has something to do with the Civil War. Right? Um, Kanye, right? and you can give me another 30, 45 minutes, I can just talk about Kanye West, because I love Kanye. So, I don't say that word about Kanye. But the song Kanye ran, um, says 2009, well, that's the year he snatched the mic from Taylor Swift. And so, it was a glorious day. And so, <laughs> that, <laughs> but the context of the song is like, I have something to say, you know what I mean? And so, it's just kind of like a reference to when he snatched the mic. That was ridiculous. Um, so yeah, uh, and so every day has is, has it has context. So lastly, a song Maka in USA, which deals with um, housing discrimination, gentrification, redlining. 1937 was when the Housing Act uh, was signed that kind of like catalyzed this idea of projects and uh, lower income neighborhoods. So, yep. Like social justice. 
justice and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of your, your work in obviously, and you're just talking now. How do you approach? Because a lot of you know social justice or a lot of the way it's produced in our culture and you know talked about in our culture is this very it's almost like very exclusive group. You know, only certain people get to feel that way or not. How do you get into that group? Or how do you you know even have a discussion with someone, especially because you know you don't exactly have the most popular stance you know in culture right now. Being a Christian, you know, sharing a Christian worldview on social justice, a lot of people would you know disregard what you're saying because of that. So how do you kind of like have those discussions with yeah. that with those groups? So <clears throat> great question, excellent question. And obviously, I've already communicated how I, I am a Christian. So for me, everything, everything I process through, everybody processes through something through their, their, their personal worldview. Some maybe atheistic worldview, some Islam, Hindu. You have a worldview in which you process information. For me, everything I do, I'm like, all right, if I am a Christian, that means I have to believe in the tenets of the faith, right? And so I start there, right? I start there, I say, I can, I can, for instance, I grew up in a, I grew up in a household that social justice issues was something that we talked about, that we loved. But then I became a Christian, and then I realized that any, mostly all the people who I knew who were Christians, especially popular pundits, were conservative, right? So you had one side of people who were conservative, and then I grew up in this community in this context of liberals, right? So I'm sitting here like schizo. I'm just like, I don't know who to listen to. And then at one point I was like, well, what, does, what do I believe the Bible to say about issues? And oftentimes I do feel like we can even take our religious figures and we can misconstrue them for our own ideological purposes as well. Um, Jesus was a very complex individual. And oftentimes I think we, we create him to be very monolithic. And so, for me, and I'm going to share something, you can feel free to disagree with this. I, when I think of Jesus, right, I think of a man who lived in a police state, in a religious state that was very oppressive. Right? So, you think about Palestine during his day, it was ruled by the Romans, right, but the Romans gave powers to, to, the, to the religious people that they would the Pharisees said and, and whatnot. Now, Oftentimes when we talk about these people, we, we talk about them in this sense of like, oh, they were just legalists, right? Well, they weren't just legalists just because they just hated people who taught a Bible study, right? They go through their, like, the, the proper bureaucracy. They wanted power. They established power, and they knew as long as we maintain power, we have control of this state. Jesus is coming through, teaching love thy neighbor, forgive people, it is directly conflicting with everything that this particular state, oppressive state, is teaching. And he's messing up their business, right? He's like, no. so we have to do something about this dude. Like, he's a rebel rouser. And so we got to remove this guy because he is causing all kind of havoc. So let's crucify him to get rid of him. Um, oftentimes, we talk about, it's funny, we talk about them, okay, today, we're going to honor him, and it's going to be this great night. But... If we were in the 60s, people didn't love Martin Luther King. He wasn't this love figure. He actually, if you ever read Birmingham's the letters from Birmingham jail, he is writing to other Christians and churches and pastors saying, why are you de demonizing me for asking for justice? You guys want us to just be quiet because you feel like justice will come eventually. And he's like, I, oppression, like, he's like, this is a heavy burden to carry. And because you have freedom and liberty, doesn't mean that we, the rest of us should just wait and eventually it'll come. He's like, no, like, there are people who, just, who, need, who need justice. And so anyway, so as we, we look at Jesus, I think what we see is someone who challenges not only our personal relationships with God, right? But he also challenges our relationships with one another and the systems in which we operate. A wonderful story is when you look at the prostitute, right? who's getting stoned, she has every legal right to be prosecuted. According to the law and according to the state, she's selling her body, she has, she needs to be prosecuted and stoned, right? But Jesus goes to these individuals and he has this kind, he, he sees that the men in this culture can commit adultery, 
they can divorce, and they can sleep around without any consequence, right? And so he says, you without sin cast the first stone. That's basically the indictment that he's saying. He said, if you aren't pr practicing the same type of unrighteousness that this young lady is practicing, then go ahead and stone her. And they can't, because they know, like, yeah, I'm smashing too. <laughs> And so what he does is he says, you know, you cast first off, but then he turns around and looks at the young lady and says, go and sin no more. Because he recognized this is not a lifestyle that you should be living. But I'm not going to blame you necessarily for the system that has been created that made you act out in this way. So justice is not just something that is, is owned by one particular group of people. It's something that I think the gospel has called us to all. And this is the other thing. If you're a Christian in this room, it's not just for Christians. You are to advocate for for the, for the well-being of society, and I know I'm throwing a lot of scriptures out here, but this is the standard in which I operate. When we talk about Daniel, and we all know the stories about Daniel, and Daniel stone in the lion's den, and you know, blah, 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 and the Lord saved him, right? But the reason why we see Daniel, Daniel is an individual who is flourishing and thriving in a culture who is, that is not Christian. But the Lord told him to be excellent in what you do. Do what you do, be excellent, and thrive, right? And he knows that his king is, 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 a, is a pagan, I guess you could say king. But even in that, he still works hard. He works so great that he becomes the fourth a governor of sorts, right? Um, but he has made a covenant with his heart. He says, I am not going to defile myself. There are certain things that I'm not going to do. But I'm going to work not only for the well-being of myself, but for the well-being of other people. And I think sometimes as Christians, we feel like we have the corner market on all that is righteous and all that is true. And the reality is, is that, yes, I believe the things that the Bible communicate is true, but we also have to understand that God can build his, his knowledge and wisdom to other people as well, as long as it doesn't necessarily conflict with Scripture. And I think there's a lot of truth that can come from both sides of the political space that doesn't conflict with the teaching of the Scripture. And so, therefore, when I'm in a space with the liberals, right, and we're talking about justice, I can agree. But if there are also times when I'm in spaces with Republicans and conservatives, I'm like, amen. But then there are times when both sides need to be challenged as well, from my, from my perspective, from my vantage point. Um, but for the political pundits in here, you may know even more than I do, the one thing that we're finding is that there is very little space for a middle in society. There are very few moderates because the polarizing of our news, uh, it's, politics is set up to win, like, and you'll do anything to win. Like, it's funny, um, uh, <clears throat> and I'm only using the Obama administration because that's the first thing that comes to mind, but um, I forget uh, Obama's chief of staff, he made a statement about how they intentionally lied about Mitt Romney because they knew that it would help them get votes. He's like, yeah, we, we lied about that. If that's the kind of character, like, that, this is the kind of practice that happens in politics, and obviously that happens in you know, our current administration, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm saying is, as Christians, that's, that's not the practice that we participate in, right? And so uh, we, we operate through a different philosophy, I believe. And, I, and, and, and so, um, but I think good human beings just, just that, like, instead of how do we win, how do we do what is right? Kind of like, check it on the GK test report. Any other questions? God was where he was. He's, he's 
always present, being blasphemed by men. But he says, another question that we should ask is, where was man during this stress? Oftentimes we talk about where was God, but where was man? Right there committing these horrible acts. And so what we have to understand is, and I probably don't want to talk about this today, when we talk about the relationship with, with, with our creator, what we have to understand is most faith and traditions talk about being created in the image of that God, right? And in the Jewish tradition, Christian tradition, if we're created in the image of God, then that means we are to treat one another as image bearers as well. The problem is, is that we don't do that. And that, in my belief system, if I believe if you have a bad theology, that creates a bad philosophy, that creates bad anthropology. So what happens is if I believe wrong about why I, why I am and who I am, then that's going to create bad practices. And I'm going to do things that are going to benefit me, right? Um, if, for me, and this obviously created a very, <laughs> a very strong social, uh, uh, philosophical debate, I know Christianity is beneficial for me because if I was not a Christian, I don't see what would keep me from doing the things that I want to do, and then I don't feel like you have the right to tell me why I can't do those things. Because I hold to my belief system, and therefore I'm going to do what I want to do. Right? But I do feel like because I hold myself to a standard, I think that people should hold me to that standard as well. Um, very similar to how people challenge, I guess you can say. Uh, so anyway. Uh, also, no, I do think there's been a terrible atrocities done in the name of religion, obviously, and I think that should be acknowledged. But I don't think there, that, that, that shows any necessary partiality um, by God. What I would say is what needs to happen is how do you begin to help people see themselves as image bearers that deserve dignity? I think everybody deserves dignity. No matter who they are or what they practice, people deserve dignity. And the problem is, is that oftentimes our politics, our philosophies don't, don't attribute dignity to people. And so for me, I believe I have faith that teaches me and tells me to treat people in a dignified way. Um, and so hopefully I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Now there's obviously some slippery slope in there, but I do think it's because people 
strive for what really would bring Spain and would bring stardom. And I'll just take it back to an area where I feel like I have some expertise in is this music, right? So in hip hop, hip hop music from like the late, from the 70s to about the 90s, the early 90s, you hardly ever heard anybody curse in hip hop song. It was just taboo, you just didn't curse because it was just like, well, it's not marketable, right? Because we're trying to get music to the youth and to the kids and they, the whole reason for Hip hop started in these kind of like youth gatherings in the streets of the Bronx and Brooklyn, right? Well, then eventually what happened is um, it became more commercial. Right? And so eventually, gangster rap became more commercial. Um, and once executives saw commercial rap, I mean, gangster rap become so commercial, then that became kind of like the, the golden path. And then after that, now guess what executives do? Like they do with any kind of music. They say, hey, can you find me another Snoop Dogg? Can you find me another NWA? Because we need, I need to make money, right? And this is what happens in, in society. We try to find what makes money, what helps us. And so, um, I guess, uh, yeah, that would, be the, that would be the short answer. I think it's more so what makes money rather than people, people seeking to do bad. Because I don't think people are actually seeking to do bad. I think they're figuring out how, what's the quickest way to success, fame, and stardom. And if it's this, then I'll do it. Yep. I, yep, go ahead. That's great, and I, and I, 
let's be clear, because when you said that, you're talking like, I don't want to sound like that dude who's like perfect, because <laughs> I, I violate my ethics all the time. So this is Achilles, let's be good. So the one thing I'll say, for instance, that's a great question. My daughter's 13, right? The one thing I don't do, my parents did a pretty decent job with me, and I've seen other parents do differently, and I don't judge them, but the one thing I don't do is that you cannot listen to this. Like, you can absolutely not. This is what you have to listen to. You can only listen to Christian music. I let her listen to whatever, and then when she listens to it, and if I feel like there's some questionable stuff in there, I will have a conversation and say, hey, what do you what do you think about this song? What makes you like it? What, what, what about the lyrics um, do you like? What are some things that you think may be you know, questionable? And then she's, man, and I think, honestly, from doing that from a young age, she developed muscles to be able to discern, I think, stuff that I think she understands to be somewhat more adult things versus things that are acceptable for a preteen or a teenager. Um, and so now, honestly, I don't, I don't feel like I have to police her as much as I used to. Obviously, there's going to be a time where we're going to have to have more conversation. Um, and so I think about trying not to create rigid guidelines and rules in my house because I don't believe that creates good people. Like saying, I think it's, I think, you know, it helps. But ultimately, the idea is to speak to the heart, right? And once you, if you train the heart, everything else follows. And I feel like I want you to understand why you love something, uh, and why you believe in something, and why you understand something. I'm not going to tell you to believe this. I'm not going to tell you to believe this. I hope that you follow these things. I hope you love these things. But at the end of the day, you're going to, you may believe differently. You may think differently. You may like this song. You may not like that song. And if she begins to break through the things that I teach her, she gets kicked out of my house. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just like, well, I love her. I mean, you know, it is, it is what it is. My parents had the same for me. My parents had all these ideas for me. And when I came home with the mistake after mistake, they were very disappointed in me. I have a friend who he says, he makes a statement, and I, I, I love it. He says, when he talks to people who mess up, he says, it's okay, but it's not okay. And that's kind of like how I say it. It's not okay, but it's okay. Because right? it's not the end of the world. We'll, we'll work through this. We'll get through this. But um, <clears throat> I want you to understand that, yes, love doesn't just ignore wrongdoing. Love acknowledges it and loves and serves despite the wrongdoing. Let's thank uh, Sean for her uh, Yeah.